Good morning. If you'll stand and take your hymnals, turn to 147, How Great Thou Art. Father, Lord Jesus, the most precious Holy Spirit, indeed, how great thou art. And it's our privilege and honor this morning to gather in your house 
and to worship you. And as we worship you this morning, Father, we ask that your spirit works upon our hearts and helps us to become more and more and more like Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now if you'll turn over to 171, Awesome God. standing if you would take your bulletin and turn to the inside cover we will affirm our faith together by reciting in unison the Apostles Creed which says I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only Son our Lord who is conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified dead and buried he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sat upon the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. God, we come before you this morning acknowledging that you are awesome in power and might, but you are also awesome in holiness and righteousness, in grace and mercy, in forgiveness and redemption. We praise you for your awesome power. Father, as we praise you, we realize just how much we need your mercy and your grace, how much we need forgiveness and redemption. For we are often less than holy and far from righteous. So, Lord, this morning we come and we confess our sins. Those things which we have done which are contrary to your word and your will. And those things we have failed to do that you've asked us to do. We confess all of our sins, Father, each and every one of them. And they vary among us, but they are all present among us. We ask your forgiveness as we confess them. For your word promises us as we confess that you will cleanse us from them, from all unrighteousness. And that's what we ask for this morning, that cleansing so that we can be before you a holy vessel, ready for your spirit to be poured into so our lives can be changed and we can become more and more and more like Jesus. And as we become more like him, Father, we, we realize the importance of lifting up in prayer others, needs of others instead of merely our own needs, Father. The needs of those that are on the Gulf Coast or waiting for the hurricane to strike. The needs of those in, in West Tennessee that are recovering from the flood. The needs of those who are, are facing the pandemic that is not only here but everywhere we know of. The needs of those stranded in Afghanistan. The needs of those in our hospitals here. The needs of the grieving families in our church family this very day as loved ones are being laid to rest this week. Father, the needs are huge and they're varied. They're not all physical. Some are 
financial, some are relational, some are emotional, some even mental and spiritual, Father. But we know that in Christ Jesus you can supply all of our needs. And that's what we ask for this morning, Father. For your spirit to overwhelm the lives of those for whom we pray. And we always include ourselves. But your spirit may over flood, overwhelm us. May flood into our lives in such a way that we find hope. We find peace. We find healing. We find all that we need to have the life that you promised us. We love you, Father, and we trust you to do exactly as you promised that you would. And now, if you would, please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>
worship His holy name. Sing like this. to give generously this morning is again found in Psalm 96 where the psalmist writes ascribe to the Lord O families of the peoples ascribe to the Lord glory and strength ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name bring an offering and come into his courts let us now worship God through our giving Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, and most precious Holy Spirit, once again we come before you thankful and grateful for every good and perfect gift that you poured into our lives. And Father, as we come to that portion of this service where we had the opportunity to return a, a small portion of that which you've given us back to you, we thank you for the generosity of your people. And we ask, Lord, that you take the offerings that have been given this day, either through mail or in hand this day. That you take them and you bless them and you multiply them so that there's always enough. That just like the, the widow in Elijah's time, every time she went back to the jar, there was enough flour and enough oil to make another cake. Father, that's what we ask for. Enough to do all that you've called us to do. In your holy name, amen. You may be seated. And as you do, I want to ask our children to come forward. Those that are here, and uh, Mr. Steve is on his way. Good morning. Sleepy bunch this morning? A little bit? I'm feeling sleepy, I'll say that. So, I'm working on it. So, speaking of sleepy, what do what I have here? Yeah. 
So, um, what are blankets good for? Not getting cold, that's right. Or taking a nap in the afternoon if you want to cover up or something, right? Um, I'm sure you guys are big and brave and you never get scared, but I remember when I was a little boy sometimes laying in bed at night and if I had a bad dream or something scared me, I kind of would take the covers and pull them up over my head. You all ever do that? And just hide under the covers and think nothing's going to get me under the covers, right? And... Um, I don't think a blanket really offers that much protection if something was going to get us, but it made us feel better, didn't it? Yeah, and that one's kind of soft, isn't it? But you know, did you know that God promises that He will cover us and protect us? So one of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 27. And... Um, it's not as well known as a lot of the other Psalms. But in verse 5, he says, For God will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble, and he will conceal me under the cover of his tent, and he will lift me high upon a rock. So there's no reason for us to be afraid, right? If we've got God on our side, no matter what happens, he's always going to shelter us and take care of us. That makes sense? So next time you're laying in bed and you get scared and want to pull the covers over your head, you can do that, but then ask God to pull His cover over you too and take care of us, okay? All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank You that You do not only cover us with Your protection, but with Your love and Your grace and Your mercy, and we're so grateful and thankful for that. Lord, be with us this week to come, protect these young ones, and give us all grace to walk with You in the coming week. In Christ's name we pray all these things. Amen. Thank you, guys. Take your hymnals and stand and turn to 552. I am thine, O Lord.
before I begin, let me let me say to those who may be a little bit unnerved in this day of COVID with my raspiness of my voice or my occasional cough, but according to the medical experts I have consulted, even in the midst of a pandemic, allergies will still mess you up and cause you to have drainage and mess your throat up. And that's all I have, not contagious or anything. So I'll let you know that up front. I will still wear my mask when I come down and greet anyone after the service as well, but don't be scared of my voice. Well, more scared than normal of my voice. Can you imagine what it would have been like to have met Jesus in person? Have you ever thought about that? Ever, ever maybe fantasized a few minutes what it would have been like to have met Jesus, to walk with Jesus, to hear Jesus? I mean, if we could have been there, we would have watched in bewilderment as he healed the sick. We have been amazed as he walked on the waves of the raging sea. We surely would have been inspired as we heard him speak to the crowds and then been mesmerized as he explained the meanings of his teachings to his disciples. It would have been mind-blowing, to say the least. Mind-blowing to have witnessed these things. Yet when the disciples saw Jesus teach and perform miracles, they did not clamor, Lord, Lord, teach us to teach like you. They didn't clamor even, Lord, Lord, teach us to do miracles like you. Instead, what captured their attention was observing Jesus pray. Can you imagine that? All of that phenomenal stuff they witnessed and what captured their attention was observing Jesus pray. Luke chapter 11 verse 1 says, While Jesus was praying, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. In response to this request, Jesus gave them what we know as the Lord's Prayer. With all that said, I'm going to ask you to please rise and body your spirit in honor of God's Word. I will be reading, uh, we'll be reading Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 through 13 and I'll be reading this morning from the King James Version because it is the traditional version of the Lord's Prayer that most of us are aware of uh, and it's also given in the Sermon on the Mount but it's also the translation we use in our bulletin every week so I didn't want to confuse so folks. But anyway, here in Matthew chapter 6 it says, After this manner therefore pray ye our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we ask for you to speak to us this morning. Speak so clearly that there's no doubt that we have heard from you. If you can use my words, Father, please do so. If not, drown me out so that your spirit is clearly heard this day. In your holy name, amen. You may be seated. Of all the prayers prayed throughout the world, few, if any, are repeated as often as the Lord's Prayer. Yet despite this prayer's popularity, it is often undervalued and sometimes even misunderstood. You see, some people have turned the Lord's Prayer into something magical, as if the words themselves hold special sway with God. These folks seem to think that if they just pray this prayer, then everything will be okay thus treating the Lord's Prayer like some sort of good luck charm. And I'm here to inform you this morning, it is not a good luck charm. It is so much more. For others, the prayer is recited out of mere habit, making it easy to daydream that does not pay any attention without attaching any real significance to the words that you're saying. 
which of course is the exact opposite of Jesus' intention. As he said just before introducing the Lord's Prayer, he said this to his disciples, when you pray, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. So it's, it's not magic, and it's just not something we recite from memory. What is it? In his second epistle, the Apostle Peter told us that by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for a godly life. Everything we need. Everything we need includes direct communication with God. You cannot live a godly life without prayer. It will not, it cannot happen. With that in mind, I would suggest to you that in the Lord's Prayer, God has gone as far as to provide some basic talking points for our conversation with Him. Now, I'm not alone in this suggestion, as many biblical scholars over the centuries have referred to the Lord's Prayer as the model prayer. Perhaps you've heard it referred that way yourself, the model prayer. This prayer provides us some basic lessons for our conversations with God. Basic lessons, steps to follow, things to make our prayer life more meaningful, more effective, things that allow our prayers to help us become more and more and more like Jesus. I suppose over the years, most of us here have seen that bumper sticker that says prayer changes things. This is yes. This is I'm asleep. Okay. Prayer changes things. And I don't disagree with that, but here's what I want you to really know. Prayer changes the prayer. Prayer changes the prayer, the one who prays. So this, this model prayer is here because when we pray using these, these lessons, it helps us to become more and more like Jesus. <coughs> While we need to communicate with God on a daily basis, at minimum, it is good to have a regular scheduled time to pray. Nonetheless, sometimes we need to pray when it's not set on our schedule, when it's not on our calendar. You see, fear and anxiety over a situation are signs that we need to pray right now. If it's big enough to think and worry about, it is big enough to pray about. I know sometimes we think, I don't know if this is really worthy of a prayer. <laughs> if you're struggling with it, pray about it. If something is on our minds, it is on God's heart. So talk to him about it. Now, <clears throat> have you ever been afraid to talk someone, talk to someone because you did not know what to say? Many people are reluctant to talk to strangers. And more and more people are even unwilling to wave at someone they do not know in their own neighborhood. It, it amazes me how many people I wave at that just look straight ahead and don't even acknowledge you're around. The cure for this, though, the cure for struggling to talk to strangers, struggling even to wave at your neighbor, the cure for this is getting to know our coworkers, our classmates, and neighbors. Because it is much easier to talk to someone we know well than it is to a stranger. And the same is true when it comes to talking to God. In fact, the number one reason we fail to pray is we don't think we have a close enough relationship with the one to whom we're praying to. Get to know God and it will be easier to talk to Him. Sometimes though, sometimes even if we have a close relationship with God, it is difficult for us to pray because our situation has left us at a loss for words. Have you ever been there? So confused you didn't even know what to ask for? Most of us have experienced this from time to time. But the good news is that through the power of the Holy Spirit, God understands even the groanings of our heart. What's the groanings of our hearts? The uggs. The moments we can't put it into words, but our emotions are real. God 
understands even that. On our own, we are incapable of knowing how to pray or even wanting to pray. But in the words of the Apostle Paul, it is God who makes us able to do all that we do. And that includes openly communicating with him. See, we think of prayer sometimes as us dialing up the phone and talking to him. Did you know he calls you? He does. He knows your number. And if you're lucky, he doesn't call you at 2 a.m. He seems to like to call me at 2 a.m. He knows your number. If we're familiar with the four New Testament Gospels, we have probably noticed that two of these books contain the Lord's Prayer. There's the version recorded in the Gospel of Matthew that I read earlier, and also a slightly different version in the Gospel of Luke. While the wording is not identical, both contain the same basic lessons for communicating with our Creator. So what does the Lord's Prayer teach us about communicating with God? First of all, though it is politically correct, incorrect, I should say today, politically incorrect, the model prayer teaches us that God wants us to call him Father. Now, <clears throat> Jesus could have used a different title to address God in the model prayer. He had a wide array to choose from, and he knew how long time was going to last. He could have picked a different title, but he deliberately chose to use our Father. Now, does that mean that the only way we can Address God when we pray is to call him Father? No, not at all. There are multiple biblical expressions referring to God that are quite appropriate for our prayers. Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, to name just three. What Jesus was pointing out, the reason Jesus used our Father was he wanted us to know God's warm, personal, and authoritative position in his life and therefore in the lives of his followers. He wanted us to know who God is. God is our spiritual father. And as Christ followers, we are his children. In Romans chapter 8 verse 15, the Apostle Paul assured believers that you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. That's Daddy. That's a personal. Christ wants us to know right off the bat in this model prayer that we can have a personal relationship with God. He's not some distant deity whom we have to fear that if we get a sentence wrong in our prayer, he'll strike us down. But he's a loving God who wants to hear from his children. And just so there would be no confusion, or better yet, no comparison between God and earthly fathers. And as a dad, that's the worst thing ever, to be compared to God. Because there's no way we can stand up to it, right guys? It can't happen. But <clears throat> so that there would be no comparison, Jesus made an important distinction in this prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven. Now the second thing this model prayer teaches us about communicating with God is that his name is deserving of the very highest honor. The very highest honor. Jesus used the phrase, hallowed be thy name. Now since hallowed is not a term most of us use in everyday life, in fact I've had conversations with most everyone here, I've never heard you use it outside of reciting this prayer. Hallowed is not a word we use. I thought I would share how other translations interpret this ideal. The contemporary, contemporary English version says, help us to honor your name. The Good News translation says, may your holy name be honored. And the New Century Version says, May your name always be kept holy. We need to remember that Thursday night. May your name always be kept holy. The point is this. Not only is our Heavenly Father holy, He is worthy of our praise. 
Why is God worthy of our praise? There are many reasons as to God's praiseworthiness. But 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 2 sums it up like this. There is no one holy like our Lord. There is no God but you. There is no rock like our God. Now understand, our prayers do not have to be formal. That scares a lot of people from praying in public. They're, li they're a little concerned that maybe all their sentences won't be complete. Our, our prayers do not have to be formal. They do not even have to be grammatically correct to effectively communicate with God. God speaks redneck as well as English and Japanese and every other language on the face of the earth. They do need, our prayers do need to be mindful of who God is and what he has done for us. He's not our buddy on the street corner. He's our Abba Father. He's our friend. But we need to be mindful of who he is. Romans chapter, excuse me, Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now the third thing the model prayer teaches us about communicating with God is that he wants to reign in our hearts and lives. This is why Jesus said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. By saying this, Jesus reminded us to seek God's plan, not ours. To seek God's plan, not ours. In essence, God wants us to pray, Lord, I know that your plans, your way, your everything is what's best for me. Do you believe that? His plan, his way, his everything is what's best for me. Now, compare God's desire for our prayers to our typical method of praying, which goes something like this. Lord, this is what I want you to do, and do it quick. I'm surely not the only one that's ever prayed that. You know, Lord, here's step one. Just in case you're confused, Lord, here's step two, and here's step three. And by the way, I want it done by Thursday. We're always trying to conform God into our will instead of being conformed into his will. Think of the harmful relationships that could have been avoided in our lives. Think of all the dead-end jobs that could have been bypassed. Think of all the damaging words that could have been held back from our lips if we had truly allowed God to reign in our hearts and lives, if we had sought His will and not ours. By the way, allowing God to reign in our lives is what ripens the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. It is what makes us more and more and more like Jesus. The way to victory is surrender. For when we surrender our will to his will, he can use us to accomplish great things. But as long as we're stubborn, don't listen to this part, Joanna, but she would confirm I am stubborn. As long as we're stubborn, as long as we're fighting the will of God, he can't bless us the way he wants to. Or we may get blessed along the way, he can't bless us the way we desire to because we're not where we're supposed to be to receive his blessing. The way to victory, the way to the abundant life that Jesus promised his followers is surrender to the will of God. The fourth thing the model prayer teaches us about communicating with God is he wants us to be dependent upon him for everything. Everything. This is why Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. Now, I do not know about you, but I typically want more than day, daily provisions. I want weekly, monthly, even yearly supplies in my bank account. I mean my bread box. The problem with this, the problem with this is that I'm putting my faith in my provisions instead of the one 
who provides for my needs. You see the difference? I'm putting my faith in what I've already collected, which is a gift from him anyway, instead of the one who gives me the gifts. For infants crying to be held, for young children needing new shoes, and for teenagers looking for encouragement, more often than not, a parent is there to meet the need. Sadly, that is not always true, but generally it is. Shortly after giving us this model prayer, still part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, If you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give good gifts to those who asked Him? As children of God, as those who have trusted Christ as our Lord and Savior, we can approach our Heavenly Father boldly in prayer when asking him to meet our legitimate needs as well as the needs of others. Our legitimate needs include things like shelter, food, transportation, and clothing. Our desire might be for a new mansion, gourmet dinners, a brand new luxury vehicle, and designer clothing. And God may give us these desires, but he promises to meet our needs. And not just our physical needs, but our spiritual needs as well. To this end, the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, that my God will liberally supply, fill until full, your every need, according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now, if you listen to this on television or radio, they're going to tell you that is a mansion and new car and designer clothes and gourmet meals, but it's not. The needs that he promises to fill include love. Everybody here needs to be loved. It includes joy. Everyone here needs joy in their life. It includes peace. Everyone here needs peace. It includes faith. You see in a pattern here? The things we really need are ultimately found in God alone. God alone. The fifth thing the model prayer teaches us about communicating with God is that He alone can forgive sin and remove guilt. This is why Jesus said, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Debts, trespasses, sins, they are all the same. And the result is the same. Separation from God and from one another. Now we know sin separates us from God, but you know it separates you from your family, from your friends, from your co-workers, from your classmates. Sin separates people from all that ultimately matters. Therefore, it is always appropriate and most of the time, frankly, necessary for us to ask God to forgive us of our sins when we pray. Then we're in a corporate setting like this and you were called upon to pray. I'm not suggesting that you name your sins. Just forgive us of our sins is appropriate for the public setting. But when you're alone and you're praying, if you want to get serious with God, don't just pray, Lord, forgive me of all my sins. Stop and name them one by one. Uh-oh. Forgive me because I got mad and that car cut me off this afternoon. Forgive me because I yelled at so-and-so when they didn't do what I wanted when I wanted it. Forgive me of name the list. By the way, this may be a long prayer, so set aside some time. Name your sins one by You want victory over sin? Name them. And ask him for help in this area one by one. Forget this blanket forgiveness. Name them one by one. Famed author and theologian C.S. Lewis once asked, was once asked this question at a seminar. They asked him, they've been debating, some of these theologians have been debating for several minutes before the seminar started and Lewis walked in the room and, and they turned to him said, what is found in Christianity which is not found in any other religion? Now these religious scholars have been having this intense debate 
And he replied, that's simple. And they looked at him rather fun, funny. But he said, that's simple. It is the forgiveness of sin. The forgiveness of sin. You see, we may find temporary comfort in positive thinking, but nothing wipes a slate clean like a God who has the power to remove sin as far as the east is from the west, to use the words of the psalmist. And you know how far the east is from the west? Well, let me give you a little pictorial here. If you were to leave the church here in the next 15, 20 minutes, whenever we get out of here, and you head due north. You can travel due north till you cross the North Pole. And then what direction are you going? South. And you can travel due south till you get to the South Pole. And then what direction are you going? North. North meets south. You leave here and you start due east. When do you start going west? Never. Never. We need a God who can cast our sins so far away from us that they can never bother us again. And how do we get that type of forgiveness? Well, it's not some quick blanket, Lord, forgive me all my sins, now I need a new car. Prayer. It's when we take the time to honestly tell him, he knows this. You're not surprising him. When we take the time to honestly tell him, where we messed up and where we need help. The sixth thing the model prayer teaches us about communicating with God is that he alone protects us from temptation and the enemy. That is why Jesus said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Of all the places Jesus lead, leads us, and he'll lead us many places. He'll lead us beside the still waters, He'll lead us in a plain path. He'll lead us in the way that we should go. Of all the places Jesus will lead us, leading us into temptation is not one of them. In fact, he does the opposite. Jesus helps us achieve victory over sin and the evil one. For in the words of Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15, God stripped the spiritual rulers and powers of their authority. We're, we're scared of people that have, or things that have no authority in our life. But God has stripped the spiritual leaders, rulers, and powers of their authority. With the cross, he won the victory and showed the world that they are powerless. Thus, his kingdom, his power, and glory are forever. Nothing can defeat the cross and the work Christ did there. Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, may your name always be kept holy. May your kingdom come in what you want to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the food we need for each day. Forgive us for our sins just as we have forgiven those who sinned against us. And do not cause us to be tempted but save us from the evil one. The kingdom, the power, the glory are yours forever. Amen. You'll stand and take your hymnals and turn to 673, verses 1, 2, and 4. Must Jesus bear the cross alone? Mm -hmm.
as always, thank you for being here this day, and I pray that God has blessed you and will continue to bless you throughout this week. A reminder that 4.30 is our uh, churchwide picnic. This is our first eating mass gathering, eating since the pandemic began. Uh, we planned it when things were a little better than they are now. But we are meeting outside, and please feel free to wear your mask even outside. There's no pressure to be on you. We'll take that silly thing off or anything like that. Feel free to wear your mask. Come out and have a good time. And uh, I would say I'm going to enjoy it anyway, but that's true. But uh, it's not potluck. We're trying to cut down on germs and bring your own food. So we're going to Food City and getting chicken. So I'm going to enjoy that after a while. I'm rambling now, so I'll hush. Receive now this benediction. Believe in the risen Jesus. And live accordingly by praying to him constantly. Seeking his will. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.